So welcome everyone to our Betsy gathering session. This is the first session from our uh, extended program for October. And we are so happy and pleased to have this session today. Um, our speakers for today, we have Lindsay Auerbach, our fan fantastic uh, RN at Eleven Health. Uh, she has lots of experience working with patients. She will talk a little bit more about herself in just a minute. But this is fantastic to have her like talking and co-hosting this session along with Dr. Robert Byrne. Um, he is also our medical director and product architect. And they will talk about nutrition and gut health. And hopefully this is a session that everybody enjoys. Uh, feel free to send your questions through the chat box. So please, um, just the only suggestion here is that we just keep our microphones on mute so we can hear everything that the speakers are like sharing in the session. And we'll be just paying attention to the questions in the chat. We'll have a final um, minute at the end of the session to just respond all the questions that you may have. And well, welcome. Thank you, Lindsay and Rob. This is all yours. Thank you. Do I need to do anything as far as recording or we're good? We're good? We are all good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So that's me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, gut health. Um, so just a quick blur about me, I suppose. Um, like Karen mentioned, my name is Lindsay. Um, I'm a very proud nurse with Eleven Health. And um, I spent about 12 years or so um, working at the bedside in surgical oncology. Um, <clears throat> fair amount of my patient population was the colorectal population. So this is where I got to learn and grow and experience the unique patient population with uh, colorectal postoperatively um, and down the road too. This was both uh, with cancer and without cancer patients because it was such a unique patient population. Um, so that's my nursing piece. Um, and then pertaining to this particular subject, I wanted to share a little bit uh, personal health background about me and what brought me to, I guess, loving this topic so much. Um, I have a disease called ankylosing spondylitis, which is basically in inflammatory arthritis. And over time, it can cause um, fusion of the vertebrae and a curvature of the spine, it can also cause problems with vision and heart and inflammation of the joints. And so I lived with this for many years, really just in pain and discomfort, um, thinking that this was just the status quo of my life. Um, a big part, I think, admittably looking back in denial, which is what I think a lot of people do living with a chronic disease. Um, a few years back, I started noticing that it greatly was impacting the quality of my life. Um, and I went to the doctor and went back to the rheumatologist and I said, you know, I'm really, I'm really struggling. And he said, Lindsay, I think it's time that we look into some medications that are a little bit more aggressive. There's medications like Remicade and Humira to really take control of this. And like any responsible patient, I left the office and I slipped into a deeper denial. And I probably did some things in my lifestyle that probably made the situation worse. And I continue to feel worse and worse, so much so that over time, a couple of years ago, I was having a hard time even holding a blow dryer and blow drying my hair. I had to greatly adjust my work schedule. I went part time. Because after work, I was literally just working and recovering, working and recovering. Um, I would come home and truly just lay on ice packs and cry until I fell asleep. And so I decided one day I was going to look into what I was doing that was, how I was living my life was affecting my life. And I started to really shift my mindset and I did some research. And through research and reading about anti-inflammatory diets and the science behind this, I came to learn and love the topic of gut health. And I made many changes to my lifestyle 
and things that I eat and how I live my life day to day. And it's dramatically changed my life. I'm not on any medications. I rarely think about my disease because I'm not very often in pain. And so this is why I feel like it's such a fascinating topic. And if you look up gut health and what we'll talk about the gut microbiome, it is something that is just evolving so rapidly as the science continues just to pour out. So it really is something that's applicable to all of us. So to start at the beginning, a quick lesson of what is the microbiome. So the microbiome is really something that we need to understand to understand how it impacts our health. So in brief, a microbiome is a collection of microorganisms that are living together in an environment. So this is bacteria, viruses, fungi, algae, protozoa. This is their space, this is their home, this is their environment. And every soil and sediment on earth has a microbiome, the ocean, the atmosphere, our bodies. And within our bodies, we have a microbiome of our skin, our mouths, our digestive tract, really anywhere that comes into contact with the outside world has a microbiome. And generally, these microorganisms don't harm us. And in fact, they're actually essential to us. They help keep this balance between um, our lives and our health. So we're looking for this constant balance, really. We need them and they need us. So we're working together. So when we look specifically to the human microbiome, we look at our bodies. So let's say this is me. And let's say this is even me after I wash my hands and hand sanitize my hands after we are so often doing much more now. But in fact, when we really look at ourselves, this is what we look at because we are covered in trillions of microorganisms that are living inside and on our bodies and we want them there this is their home and in fact there are an estimated 1000 different types of these microorganisms that are living within our bodies and what's super cool is if you think about how many that is if you were to pull them all out mash them all together and weigh them they total six pounds and these are things that you can't even see with the naked eye. And so if that doesn't make you go, oh my gosh, that's amazing, six pounds, that's a lot. And you compare it to the weight of a brain, the human brain weighs three pounds. So that's pretty impressive. In fact, we are made up of more microorganisms than we are in fact human cells. It's actually a 10 to one. So when people talk about the impact of the microbiome of your body, we are in fact more microorganisms than we are in fact human cells. And of all of these microorganisms, approximately 39 trillion of them are living within our gut, which is why the gut microbiome is so important because so much of this microbiome of our body is housed in our gut. Diversity of this microbiome is unique to each of us. So my microbiome is different than your microbiome, it's different than your mom's microbiome. And diversity is like, it's like our fingerprint. So it doesn't even matter if you and I eat the same thing for every meal every day, it's still gonna be different. In fact, what's super cool is that because I was born a C-section baby, that automatically started my microbiome different. So our microbiome starts from birth. Diversity is so important in the gut microbiome. In fact, our gut microbiome is just like an ecosystem. So here we have a picture of the Amazon rainforest. So here in the Amazon rainforest, we have plants and animals and microorganisms, and they all come together to create this nice, beautiful, balanced space that they call home. And they need this balance and exchanges for survival. If I came into the Amazon rainforest and I said, I hate spiders, which I do, and I wiped them all away and I took away all the spiders, what would happen is there would be losses and gaps because of that disruption. So everything that eats the spiders are now affected 
right? Because they have nothing to eat, they're starving. And everything that's there that the spiders eat, now there's an overgrowth up. So guts work, our guts work in the same way. They share those same needs. They're looking for that same balance, that starvation, that overgrowth, that balance. So the environments and our foods and our behaviors are all influencing this gut health. So to create this balance, they need us and we need them. And it's really a for better or for worse relationship. This is where we hear the word dysbiosis. When we have a loss of this harmonious balanced relationship, we have what's called dysbiosis. And this is when we hear about a lot of diseases and symptoms and things that are happening to our health and the studies, this is what's seen. seen. There's dysbiosis, there's this disbalance that's occurring. So all the ways that the gut is connected to our health are really, again, just coming more and more and more in studies. Um, the diverse health microbiome does so much more than just processing our foods, right? We've learned so much more in recent years and it's operating almost like our command center now for our body. And it impacts our health so much. These are some of the ways that our gut connections are happening with diseases and our health. There's a lot and there's more. And for whatever excites you here in front of you, this is where I would really encourage you to say, I wanna open my own personal exploration into gut health and maybe some own personal changes. I am gonna to touch on a few, <clears throat> digestion, immunity, and cognition. So regarding the immune system, right past this intestinal um, wall, there is 70% of your immune system living inside of your gut. So this is where your body's fighting army sits. And so when there is an infection or any potential harm that's coming its way, your immune system's job is to keep it out, right? That's what our immune system does. And you can see here, the gut bacteria and your immune system are talking and they're separated by one single, one single wall. And this single cell layer is so small, it's actually smaller than the diameter of a strand of hair, okay? So although you can see here that they're two separate things, they're like almost living in, in, in one world. They're like a brand new relationship where they're just so obsessed with each other and they always have to be with each other. They're always like you can see in constant communication, laughing, loving, living life together. So you can understand is that with this constant communication, what one feels, the other feels, how one is affected, the other is affected because they're in this constant communication. And so what we know is that this constant communication is what affects this autoimmunity, this inflammation when there's suspected infections. So again, if you hurt one, you're hurting the other. Our immune system's job here is to create this, this balance. So we're looking to whatever's coming in from the outside world, how do we manage it? How do we make sure that we're tolerating it? And how to make sure that there is a balance. And so sometimes there's imbalances and shifts within the immune system. And so this is why it's so important that we're managing the gut health and the communication to the other side. So digestion is another big one. <clears throat> so we know that digestion is responsible for, of course, we're extracting our nutrients from our food. We have this good bacteria that does more than just helping with digestion. They actually are keeping that bad bacteria in check. And so as you can see sitting at the table here, you've got the, guy, the bacteria pizza guy over here, and you've got all of these other good nutritious bacteria sitting at the big table. And so these good bacteria can multiply and multiply and take up more space and growth. And so there's not as much room for that bad bacteria. So feeding that good bacteria will actually support this digestion system, allowing for better absorption to take place. Um, your brain, if anybody's heard of 
gut health. They've heard of maybe the brain. And there's this like, there's this term of your brain being, uh, your gut being your second brain. So through the release of the neurotransmitters and your hormones and molecules that are sending signals, you've got your brain health starting in your gut. So there's actually 50 million nerves that are in your intestine that are sending information through what's called your vagus nerve to your brain. There are 50, five, sorry, 500 times more messenger molecules that are going from your gut to your brain. So the, there's more mess, there's 500 times more messenger, messages going from your gut to your brain as opposed to your brain to your gut, which when you think of that term, the second brain, it's interesting because it's almost like, almost like a reverse thing because there really is so much more thought and command going on in your gut than maybe even your brain sometimes. So gut microbes actually communicate with the brain through the immune system. So we look at serotonin and dopamine um, in regards to mood, mood and energy levels and your motivation. And 90% of your serotonin and 50% of your dopamine is actually made and processed in the gut. So like I mentioned earlier, can either help us or it can hurt us. When there's damage and there's dysbiosis, this is where we see things in the connection between anxiety and depression and diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and migraine and chronic fatigue. So when there are disruptions to the gut, what are the things that are, that are causing disruptions? So these are just a few of, I think, the big ones, my big ones that impacted me that caused this disruption, this imbalance of dysbiosis. Um, sugar, sugar is a big one for me. I think I had processed sugar all the time, every day, and I stopped eating processed sugar, went through a sugar withdrawal. And it's interesting because whenever I do have sugar, my body feels it. I feel fatigue and I get headaches. My body doesn't like it. Because sugar can actually create an overgrowth of the bad bacteria that we don't want. And it's basically feeding them and it's increasing the bad bacteria in the gut. Um, we know too that it can lead to um, increased inflammation um, throughout our bodies, throughout our digestive tracts as well. Um, processed foods, for me personally, I eat real food. Um, not things from a box, I eat real food because I am feeding not just my body, but I'm specifically feeding my gut, the, uh, the microbiomes in my gut. And they want real food because the bacteria that's there needs to get fed and we want to feed it good things. And I don't want the bad, the, the good bacteria there that's not getting fed because I'm giving it processed food to die off. And that's what happens when we eat processed foods. Foods that are high in pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So this is where, um, if you guys are familiar, if you heard of it, GMO, so genetically modified organisms come into play. So these are basically um, crops that are modified so that they can tolerate the chemicals being sprayed on them. So when we eat these things, we're eating the chemicals that are sprayed on them. So it's made to kill the weeds and things like that in the crops. So what's it going to do when we eat it? It's going to kill the bacteria in our gut as well. So this is a big one. This is a popular one that we hear about, Roundup, glyphosate. Um, it's sprayed on our lawns, it's, it's sprayed in fruits and vegetables, things that aren't organic. Um, so looking for non-GMO um, can be really important for feeding and not harming that good microbiome. Antibiotics, um, I actually used to get sinus infections like three times a year, so I was on antibiotics all the time. Interestingly enough, I have not had a sinus infection since I've made this shift. But really just looking to take antibiotics when you truly need them because their job is to kill bacteria. And if you do need bacteria, making, if you do need antibiotics, making sure that you're giving extra good, extra food to those good, to that bacteria, that good bacteria in your gut. So this is where it comes into play for prebiotics and postbiotics. There are some medications actually that can hinder and disrupt that microbiome. There's proton pump inhibitors like Nexium. Um, Prilosec, um, excessive use of non-steroid anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and Motrin, stress, 
Um, stress is a big impact on your immune system. That is your first line of defense. Your immunoglobulin A sits in your gut. So being aware of your stress levels, trying to get good sleep, meditating, self-care, giving time for yourself. So what can we do to improve our gut health? There's a lot of really cool things um, that we can do. The first few actually um, have a direct impact connection between your gut brain barrier. It's through your vagus nerve. And so when you stimulate the vagus nerve, which its job is this rest and digest place, um, you can actually impact your gut health. So things like yoga can be stimulating to that smooth muscle lining. It can help with digestion. Singing, which is super cool because you don't even have to have a good voice for it to work, but that exercises, those vibrations can stimulate the vagus nerve acupuncture, laughing, the same idea as singing is it exercises the vagus nerve and it stimulates it. Going outside, walking, gardening, hiking, going to the beach, getting dirty, cultivating good bacteria, changing your environment, that's really important too. Um, exercising can cause growth of the good bacteria, so be, regardless if it's 10 minutes a day, getting moving is important. Having a pet or petting somebody else's pet, sharing microorganisms, there's even studies about kissing other people that is good for gut bacteria. Um, there's herbs like cinnamon and turmeric that are really helpful for, anti um, for antimicrobial and anti-inflammation. Um, then there's prebiotics. So prebiotics are things that stimulate good growth of bacteria. So they basically act like fertilizer for your gut. So these are things like, um, these are things that a lot of like fruits and vegetables. And then there's probiotics. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of probiotics that you can take. Um, you're basically swallowing in a capsule, all these little um, organisms, but you can actually eat them naturally. So this is like, your yogurt, which is making sure that it's not full of sugar because interestingly enough, the sugar when you add to this yogurt actually kills that good bacteria that you want. Fermented foods are great, anything pickled. So kimchi, kefir, sauerkraut, miso, and um, they all have great microorganisms in there. And then nurturing foods. So these are fiber soluble and insol insoluble fiber foods. Um, making sure that you're getting a good, again, variety of foods, um, eating the rainbow, having a nice variety is really important. So that I think is a great segue into Dr. Fern's um, piece of nutrition. And so I'm going to pass it, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna pass it off to you. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, first of all, apology, my camera, I'm having an issue with my uh, camera. So I am, you're gonna have to live with my voice uh, and my slides. Uh, so let me just um, share my slides with you guys. Um, so a little bit about me first um, and, and thank you Thank you, Karen, for the introduction earlier. So um, my name's uh, Rob Fern. I'm a gastroenterologist uh, by background, uh, and I'm part of the faculty here at uh, also Eleven Health's Chief Medicine. Um, my clinical training took me through um, a specialty in inflammatory bowel disease uh, and intestinal failure. I also managed um, the uh, motility department at uh, my hospital in London before I came out here. So I've seen a lot of um, really the, both the inflammatory end and motility end of gastroenterology uh, and the impacts that that has on clinical nutrition. Um, and I've got a, a long standing and really uh, deeply um, sort of rooted interest in, in nutrition. Um, and nutrition is, one of those areas that uh, means different things to different people. Uh, and I've kind of um, made it part of um, my work really to, to try and improve the accessibility to what is nutrition, um, what is the impact of nutrition on health. 
um, and what are the extremes that we need to worry about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is this nutrition thing, what's all the fuss about. Um, we hear it every day, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll struggle to get through a newspaper, a magazine or, uh, or television news without seeing something about nutrition. Um, but really, what is it? What does it mean? Uh, what are the causes of malnutrition? What are the consequences of malnutrition? Uh, and when it comes to diets uh, and restriction, uh, changes that we make, when is that okay? Um, and when, where are those pitfalls? Um, and how can we avoid them? So really a lot of this um, uh, sits very nicely with, with what Lindsay was talking about. And I think this figure kind of shows it a little bit. So nutrition is all about finding the sweet spot. Um, depending on, on uh, what definitions you look at, um, we classify people uh, by, by different aspects of their weight. One of the easiest ones is the, the body mass index, the ratio uh, of your weight to your, uh, to your height. Um, there are some well-publicized issues with when it becomes inaccurate, but if you look across the population, it's a really accurate tool of telling us um, where people sit, uh, whether their weight is in a healthy range uh, or the unhealthy range. And broadly speaking, the way it should look is something like this, uh, that there's a large uh, healthy range between uh, somewhere around uh, 18 and a half or 19 up to around 25. Anywhere above 25 is considered overweight and anything above 30 is considered obese. And on the other end of the scale, uh, anything below 18.5 is considered underweight uh, and below um, 17 is considered seriously underweight uh, and at risk. Um, and, and why show it like this? Because um, when people talk about nutrition in a consumer sense, in the things that you read in the magazine or, or hear on the news, they're often talking about this part in the middle, keeping healthy, staying healthy. Um, often you'll hear articles and things around uh, obesity ep epidemics and, and problems uh, percentage of people who are overweight, um, but re rarely do you hear a lot about the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and particularly for a, a population who's at risk uh, or has underlying conditions, that under nutrition is, is a big issue. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So the bits in the middle um, is where the, um, the things that Lindsay was talking about sit very, very nicely. Um, the impact on our nutrition on the gut brain axis. Uh, how our microbiome affects that, things like physical activity, uh, feeling healthy, being healthy, so sort of maintaining uh, that status, um, and, uh, and having a, a healthy uh, gut environment, the right bacteria, the right motility, the right sensing um, distribution. Um, when you get into the extremes, that's when you start getting into the pathology of nutrition. So up here at the obese end, um, a high BMI is linked to uh, poor insulin resistance, so diabetes, uh, poor uh, increased atherosclerosis in blood, blood vessels, so high blood pressure, uh, and the things that come with that, so heart disease, stroke. Down here at the lower end, um, I'm going to show you a number of ways why undernutrition is an incredibly dangerous and underrecognized phenomenon as well. So on the overweight side, um, it is an epidemic, and there is a, a serious problem going on. And uh, you know, I, this is a statistic about Americans, and, and I'm not using that because, uh, because of where I'm from, because we have exactly the same issue. But I'm using this statistic uh, just to help make the point 66% of Americans are overweight, um, but more than a third are, are clinically obese. Um, and that is a very real problem because that's going to lead to um, an epidemic of, uh, of heart failure and stroke, sorry, uh, heart disease and stroke. Uh, and do away with so many of the gains we've made in the last 30 or 40 years in that area. But here's a problem. Uh, undernutrition is hugely overrepresented in people that have an underlying gastrointestinal condition. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, gastrointestinal cancers, um, and not just GI conditions. Anybody who has an inflammatory disorder uh, is using more energy and is at risk of undernutrition. Um, the elderly, at least a third of the elderly in the community, um, are, have uh, clinical uh, malnutrition or malnutrition risks. Um, and the hospital population uh, has a huge amount of nutritional risk as well. 
So as a gastroenterologist, these are the ends that I end up being most involved in, the top end and the lower end. But I spend a lot of time in my clinics talking to people in the middle about how to keep them in that green zone. So, so why worry about this? What's the impact of it? Uh, and one way to look at it is financial. Um, so malnutrition, both ends of the clinical nutrition spectrum, lead to increased visits to primary care doctors, increased hospital admissions, longer hospital stays, and billions in excess medical costs. And this is reproduced wherever you look in the world, uh, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, um, and, and in Asia. Uh, the same pattern has been found. So there's a, there's a cost issue, but there's also a big issue for the patients themselves. What does normal nutrition look like? Um, and Lindsay talks about a lot of things that can improve your, uh, improve your gut health overall. Um, but the starting point has to be a healthy and balanced diet. Um, and what is a healthy and balanced diet is something that can seem very confusing because of the, the huge quantity of information that's out there. So uh, a healthy diet involved, looks something like this in terms of proportions. Um, carbohydrates forming um, somewhere between a quarter to, uh, to a third of what you're eating. We can talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, so that's not the same as say sugar. Um, but you do need to have an energy source in your diet. Provided you're getting enough energy from carbohydrate, then the amount of protein you need to build muscle is around one gram per kilogram per day. So about, um, eight, for, for someone like me, about uh, 80 grams a day uh, of protein. Um, we need fats in our diet. Fat is not bad. We've kind of been led to believe that fats are a bad thing over uh, decades of public health um, sort of reporting and re research. Uh, but fats are actually essential. Um, one example of that, every cell in your body has a cell wall, and those cell walls are made of, uh, of fatty acids. So without fats, you can't have strong cells, uh, and that's when everything starts to fall apart, literally. Um, the, uh, the other example of fats, which is very relevant to, to this population, is if you've got part of your bowel that's not connected up, that's not joined up to, uh, to the top end, and you don't have fats coming across those cells to feed them, then they, those cells become inflamed. Uh, and there'll be some people I'm sure who are, who are listening to this or watching this who've uh, been told they have a diversion colitis uh, or something in a, in a part of their anatomy that's no longer joined up. Um, and the, the lack of those fatty acids um, effectively feeding those cells directly is that they decay and become inflamed. Uh, produce a lot of mucus blood and it's almost like uh, the inflammatory bowel disease that they first had an operation for. And this bit at the top left is a, is a major part of it as well, which is the fiber content. Um, so the, those soluble and insoluble fibers and this balance is what's going to drive a healthy microbiome. Um, the, the fluid intake cannot be ignored. So in, in a person with a normal length gut and normal absorption, about 30 mils per kilogram per day, is required to, uh, to maintain both good food absorption, good nutrient absorption, uh, but also good uh, uh, function of the kidneys uh, and the other circulatory systems. So it's a quick kind of piece of revision on the GI tract. So this is what it looks like uh, in its normal shape. Let's stick it on its side, and then let's turn it into something a little bit more representative. So the, the GI tract is incredibly specialized. Lindsay was talking about what happens at a cell level, and in many ways that's absolutely remarkable. You've got um, you know, three or four meters of small intestine, another uh, meter or so of, of large intestine, uh, and all of that is effectively one cell thick uh, with some surrounding structural tissues. Um, it's full of nerves, it's full of lymph nodes, and it's full of blood vessels. Uh, and it serves a function of being able to protect you from the outside world, but provide your body with everything it needs to survive. Um, and in that sense, it's really remarkable. So just from a kind of very high level, the stomach uh, is responsible for acid breakdown, churning up your food, uh, taking what you've, you've eaten and turning it into a nice soft mush uh, to be absorbed. Your duodenum or duodenum um, is responsible for producing bile, uh, and enzymes, or I, I should say, for supplying the bile and enzymes that come from other organs like your gallbladder and your pancreas uh, and helping digest the food. So you go from acid to alkaline very, very quickly. 
quick note, your stomach is hydrochloric acid. Your duodenum is almost as alkaline as bleach. There is no such thing as an alkaline diet changing or improving your health. And please don't let anybody tell you that there is because your body is extremely uh, capable of buffering between these two things. So changing the acidity of what you take in will not affect your overall and general health and can be a risk. Um, so the, you start absorption here in the small intestine. Uh, and as it goes on, you absorb your minerals, vitamins, and fats in the small intestine, and largely speaking, your colon is there for, to slow everything down, to form your stool, and to absorb water. So how can changes in the bowel affect your nutritional state? Now, let's, let's start with kind of big picture things. So we're not going to get into the biome straight away. The biggest single cause of malnutrition is insufficient intake, according to your needs. And that forms two, two kind of big buckets. One is people that, that um, if you like, uh, eat less than they otherwise would have done, either because of a psychological issue, so anorexia nervosa, or a clinical issue, for example, um, poor dentition, um, obstruction of the upper GI tract because of cancers, all those kind of things. So I can't get it, food in, therefore my body doesn't have fuel and it loses weight. Um, but the other reason is when your overall body's nutritional needs increase, but you don't increase what you eat. So I'm inflamed, but I eat the same as I normally do. Mm -hmm. So both of those things can lead to malnutrition. Um, and that, that's from a reduced, absorb, uh, reduced intake side. There's a reduced absorption side as well. So any operation that shortens the length of your gut, um, particularly if more than a meter or so of small intestine has been removed. And remember, you've got a lot of it. Uh, it's a surface area equivalent of a couple of tennis courts uh, after you factor in all the little villi and, and, and all the uh, little folds that are in there. So you remove a meter or so of that, you start becoming at risk of not being able to absorb. All those things, the fats, the minerals, the vitamins that your bowel is responsible for absorbing. Um, you don't have to have surgery to become uh, to have problems with absorption. So some conditions that cause inflammation uh, or, or flattening uh, of these tiny little villi that help create surface area in your bowel. So things like celiac disease, active inflammatory bowel disease, um, other things called sprue. Um, these can reduce the surface area and mean that you struggle to absorb even if you're eating the same amount. And then finally, um, the, uh, the overall usage, like I said. So if you have an active inflammatory disorder, Lindsay talked about angst bond, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, anything like that is gonna increase your baseline energy requirements. So what happens when there's too little nutrition in the system? Uh, lots of things. So first of all, there's a psychological effect and, and it's actually really interesting and challenging because the lower, the poorer your nutritional state, the poorer your psychological state. Uh, so a disease-related anorexia, so not the anorexia nervosa that we know of, um, that commonly affects uh, you know, uh, young people um, and, and is a very challenging disorder in itself to manage, but disease-related anorexia. So my body just doesn't want to eat. Uh, I just feel awful. And we've all felt like that when we've had a flu. And possibly for the first day or two of illness, that's a protective thing. That helps because that puts your body into a stress response. It helps you start to fight it. Some people think... Uh, with some good reason that that's why fasting diets can work. So intermittent fasting, where you um, starve yourself for one or two days a week or restrict your calories on those days and eat normally on the other days, puts your body into a more defensive mode uh, and can help uh, protect and build up your immune system over time. Uh, over a long period of time, uh, and that's the key here, so if that doesn't change after a couple of days and that's not managed, then actually the brain switches off its, its uh, nutritional, its hunger um, hormones and, and that nutritional drive. And that worsens the problem. So people come in uh, with, in a negative spiral of poor psychology, uh, low mood, um, uh, poor appetite um, and, and losing weight and undernourished. Um, and actually supplementing the nutrition can improve the psychological states and the overall drive to eat. Uh, get them out of that vicious cycle. Um, respiratory failure, because the muscles around the diaphragm and the ribs need energy uh, to, to be functioning. The risk of clots and DVTs, because if you have poor nutrition, you have poor mobility. And all of this is, is, is well evidenced. 
um, increased wound complications. So when you have a wound, it doesn't heal. Uh, that's both because you're not, uh, the wounds uh, occur because you're not moving enough, so you develop pressure sores, but also when, when you have a wound, this accounts for internal healing as well, you need uh, a good energy supply uh, and supply of certain um, vitamins and minerals, including things like zinc uh, and vitamin C, to, to aid in that wound uh, healing. And likewise, mm -hmm. hypothermia, because you don't have the um, subcutaneous fat and generalized infection risk. So there's a number of ways uh, in which uh, malnutrition, undernutrition, uh, can negatively affect you and is associated with worse hospital outcomes and, and uh, patient outcomes. Um, I, I stretched the guy a bit for obesity, but from the obesity side, um, so increased BMI, I talked about it a little bit earlier, is increasing the risk of diabetes, blood pressure, wound complications, because you just can't get the blood to that area of the skin. Again, blood clots, cardiovascular disease and stroke. So you don't want to be in either end of those things. Um, and what do we do about it? And I just say this because I think it's important to know clinically how we approach um, nutritional issues. So particularly for undernutrition, I'm going to talk about more in the interventions. Uh, we have options of nutritional supplements, of tube feeding, which we might place in the stomach or further down in the bowel, um, or into uh, parental feeding, total parental nutrition or, or IV nutrition. Um, and parenteral uh, supplementation might just be fluids and electrolytes, and, and I'm sure some of you have experienced that, uh, or it might be more than that. I think it's a really important point to make uh, that we can keep somebody alive for a very, very long time on fluids, sugar, and, I'll, and that's not to, to um, dismiss anything that Lindsay is saying, and I'll clarify that in a minute. Fluids, sugar, electrolytes, nitrogen, and vitamins. Um, and for patients that have a short gut or have insufficient ability to absorb, sometimes that's their only option. Um, and with good control and good supervision, they can, they can have a effectively uh, a close to normal quality of life. Um, and those things can keep somebody alive indefinitely. And I've managed patients who are elite athletes, um, Olympic rowers, and, um, uh, and recreational kayakers and explorers who are on uh, lifelong parental nutrition. So I think it's an important point to make, but it's food first always, because there is gonna be some impact of that. So if we're giving sugar into the vein, we're affecting insulin sensitivity. Um, we're, we're seeing spikes and drops in blood sugar. If they do have diabetes, it's much, much harder to control. And it, the, we're designed to get our energy from the gut, and that's the best place for it. And I agree, if the, if the sugar content of carbohydrate intake is too high, then that's gonna create those spikes and it's gonna affect your bio and it's gonna make you feel off. And that's why that balance needs to be there. So always food first, but know that the, the gastrointestinal community has backup options. Uh, we can use them, we do use them, and they're really effective uh, when used. And it's always done in a top-down manner. Can they eat? Let's get the meeting. Is anything stopping the meeting? How are their teeth? How are, how's their tongue? Is there a you know, big ulceration there? Is there an obstruction in the esophagus? Uh, can we just supplement them with an extra shake or two? If you've ever had a Cabaven or a Fortisip or a Nutrisip or any of these, they're horrible. They're absolutely disgusting, but they are effective. They contain the extra uh, calories and extra protein. Um, and when you need it, they are the best thing to have. Tube feeding can supplement that as well. Um, and, uh, and IV nutrition is there as an option, but it's always food first. So just kind of tacking back a little bit to the sort of diets that, are, um, that might be recommended, um, or modifications to oral intake that might be recommended by a dietitian um, or, um, or another medical professional. So sometimes people are advised to restrict part or all of what they eat. So when might restrictions be advised? Well, um, for the obese and overweight, the most effective types of uh, nutritional intervention are calorie restriction. There is some really interesting evidence about the microbiome in obesity. I think that in the future we will get to more balanced um, treatments that, are, that alter the microbiome as well as uh, dietary changes. But right now, the things that work for overweight and obesity are calorie restriction. If you look at the fanciest of diets out there, if you look at Atkins, if you look at paleo, 
if you look at uh, keto, if you look at uh, intermittent fasting, the ones that are effective are effective because they reduce your overall calorie intake. Uh, and so, so restriction to reduce weight is a valid and, and reasonable thing to do, um, but you should be aiming for the right target weight loss. I worked in professional boxing um, and we would manage our boxers within a few grams to the kilogram to get them in the right weight category. Uh, and there are two ways of doing that. You can let them eat and drink what they like and then effectively sweat them uh, until competition. And we advise not to do that. Uh, and there are some very well-documented uh, catastrophes of people doing that, particularly in, in MMA and mixed martial arts, where you can plan it. Uh, and you can look at their intake and you can look at their, their uh, training regime and you can put them in a positive or negative balance to the point that you can um, get them at the right weight. And that's well evidenced and that improves uh, outcomes in sport. And the same thing applies in, in targeting weight loss for, for health. Sometimes people are advised to restrict uh, because of triggers such as, uh, uh, because of uh, things like celiac disease. So gluten sensitivity causing inflammation in the gut. Uh, sometimes people are advised to restrict because of short gut or high output. So certain foods or certain soluble and insoluble fibers might increase output. Uh, and it may be reasonable, even free water can increase your output in the, if your gut is short enough. Um, so that is sometimes why people are restricted. And sometimes restrictions are placed when symptoms are intractable. But, so things like FODMAP diets you may have heard of, and things like um, you know, uh, other, other elimination diets can be effective if you have uh, a lot of symptoms from the gut, irritable bowel disease uh, syndrome or uh, functional and motility disorders. However, um, they are designed to improve your symptoms, not improve your overall risk of a bad outcome. You should not calorie restrict if you're not overweight. Uh, elimination diets should be followed by reintroduction, so they're fine to follow if you're looking for what's causing your symptoms, but you must start to reinvest, uh, reintroduce things. And all unexplained weight loss should be investigated. So do not ignore unexplained weight loss because it might be being caused by something else. Um, please note that diets can harm. So uh, the, the best thing to do is be in the healthy range, eat a, uh, eat a healthy uh, range of foods and then, uh, and then adjust within that. Make sure you're meeting your macro and micronutrient requirements broadly. Uh, so getting enough energy, enough protein, enough fat, uh, enough fiber and enough vitamins in. Um, for weight loss, calorie restriction and, and physical activity is, is, is best and actually improves your microbiome and improves your, your overall ratio of good to bad. Uh, you can adapt your diet and be healthy. So there's plenty of people who follow fully vegan, fully, fully vegan or fully um, uh, paleo or keto. They're kind of uh, not quite polar opposites of each other, but but they're quite hard to do both together. Um, you can do that and be healthy. Um, uh, there are um, uh, professional tennis players um, who, are, who are vegan. Uh, there are uh, Olympic athletes who, who I've managed who, um, uh, who have highly selective diets. However, they need to be carefully managed to make sure that they are not falling into deficit in any uh, of their major requirements and do it for the right reasons. So following a diet for its own sake is not worth doing. If you have, there are diets you would follow because you have a lot of gut symptoms. There are diets you would follow because you, um, uh, because you have uh, an obstruction or a risk if you don't follow it. Uh, there are diets that you would follow um, because they make you feel better and that's fine. Um, but make sure that you don't slip into um, into something that's highly restrictive and can lead you into a, a negative weight loss spiral. Uh, so how do you spot a fad diet? Something that promises a quick fix, something that sounds too good to be true, something that is presented with poor evidence or very loosely references the evidence, something that makes dramatic statements, um, especially when the uh, reputable scientific organizations have said, don't listen to this. It's not a conspiracy. They mean it because they know what they're talking about. Um, don't follow things that, that kind of lead with a list of good foods and bad foods, because there's no such thing. Uh, and always look for the book that's associated with it. That's a big red flag for me. Somebody who is selling, selling the book because they've invented the diet. Uh, look for the research would be my 
advice for that. Um, this is my take on uh, on the healthy diet, and it's maybe it's it's uh, sort of regression to the mean in terms of um, this is all sensible stuff, everything in moderation. Uh, but that's my my advice, and and actually the people that follow this, so uh, for example, Mediterranean diet, um, uh, athletic diet, are often associated with a healthier microbiome, healthy healthier brain gut uh, connections. Uh, and healthier overall um, medical state, reduced in, um, reduced uh, high blood pressure, reduced diabetes, reduced stroke, um, and reduced incidence of undernutrition as well. So having a good balance, um, these things up here in moderation, um, less concern about fish and dairy, uh, and making sure you have those five fruit and vegetables, actually it should be seven, but no one ever achieves that. Um, grains, loads of fluid, and plenty of physical exercise. And I wish that there was a, uh, a single magic cure. I wish I could say, take this one pill and it would all be better. Um, but it, wait, this is what you, this, this is what is associated with uh, better outcomes. And if I have t a take home message, it's if you're in the normal range already, don't sweat, you know, you're doing good. If you've got a, you know, a bit of symptoms, a bit of discomfort, and you want to tweak your diet, by all means do it. But do not allow yourself uh, to get into a restrictive, um, zone because that's a negative spiral and that will lead to poor outcomes. Remember active disease increases your nutritional requirements. So if you have IV, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, angst and inflammatory disorder, you may need more nutrition calories overall. Where they come from, we can discuss. Um, protein is a, is a perfectly good source of calories as long as you're getting enough of it uh, that, that you don't take it away from your muscle, for example. Um, be aware of anorexia, both disease-related anorexia, and actually, frankly, there are a lot of undiagnosed eating disorders that are wrapped up in people that follow very restricted diets. And it's, I would call it disordered eating rather than eating disorders, but it's something to look out for. Uh, and it's something that we can support. And it doesn't have, you know, that, that's a condition that should be treated, because I showed you the risks of malnutrition. And staying in the high or low range too long is a risk. So there's plenty that can be done about it. Um, but don't don't allow yourself to stay in it for too long. Um, so so that's my um, that's my take uh, on these issues. Um, I I haven't um, seen if we have questions coming through. But um, so uh, I I'm happy to open um, to a couple of questions and and Lindsay I guess um, I. I had a, a couple of things that I wanted to um, to ask you because oh dear. <laughs> this is um, it's such an interesting area. So the the combination of both the the brain gut access and um, uh, and, and nutrition. Um, the um, so when it comes to um, particularly the uh, um, the sugar and carbohydrate thing. Um, where, how, how would you recommend people to um, to kind of do that in a way that they can feel healthy, but avoiding the risk uh, of of getting into that calorie restricted state if they don't plan to be there? Um, so for me, I like for somebody that I mean to be completely transparent, like throughout my like teens and early adult life, I struggled with weight and identifying good foods, bad foods, and was never really taught that. So this was honestly a journey in identifying that as well. Um, so I, like you discussed, like fad diets and things like that. And really through this, I really like, understood like what, what is real food and where did this shift come from, from if we even think back to the nineties when everything became low fat, how did that happen? They, pour, they replace the fat with all these sugars and artificial things. Um, so for me, I, I do, I just, I don't do white sugar, refined sugar. I do, um, I do uh, coconut sugar, um, more just uh, natural sweetness. I use pure maple sugar, um, pure maple syrup when I cook, um, honey, things like that, instead of the refined sugar. 
Um, I don't know if that helps answer, but it's interesting. And then when, when I learn and I understand and I really do feel the connection, um, you know, after I really did experience this, this shift in, in, in my body, like, I don't, I don't really like crave and feel, I really am like excited for like my afternoon apple and cashew butter. <laughs> like, that's like what I look forward to, you know, whereas, you know, typically I think like I did reach for like a sugary kind of, you know, not a really nutritious carbohydrate to get me through the afternoon before. And I, I think that's a really good point. So, so you're absolutely right that um, ex excessive amounts of, uh, of sugar above and beyond kind of calorie requirement or even just not spaced out well. So a, a high density of sugar in a short space of time will cause a spike in blood sugar, a spike in insulin, a spike in, uh, in adrenaline, uh, a spike in, in uh, glucagon and, and other hormones. And, and um, over time, it will reduce the sensitivity of your cells to that insulin. Um, but it also makes you feel pretty rotten. Like it's a nice early feeling and then, and then it makes you feel pretty rotten uh, as that crashes down again. Um, and, um, you know, that along with the effects on the, on the microbiome are, are not to be sniffed at. Uh, I, I, I suppose uh, when I look at it from, from the, you know, the, the um, malnutrition perspective, uh, I worry a little bit about people that, that associate all sugar with being bad and, um, uh, and it must be restricted. So I guess my take on it is uh, there's plenty of ways of getting carbohydrate in and even sugar in in a healthy way, um, but not an excessive way. And, and you're absolutely right that the excessive um, quantities can can lead to multiple poor outcomes. Yeah, and I think also, you know, the, the types of sugar, like I don't, like I said, like use the, the white grainy sugar, and you know, there's so much other, like for that sugar, like date syrup, coconut, like other forms of, of sugar. Absolutely. Yeah. There, um, I'm, I'm gonna read a question that came through earlier, and I don't know that I have the answer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to it and then pass it to you. But there was the question of, is there concerns for um, eating antioxidant rich foods while on chemotherapy? And I, I have like read both sides of antioxidants in chemotherapy before, so I don't have the answer, but in regards to antioxidants, and I know people like search for supplements, and I know you said foods, but foods, I think, you know, in, in, in balance is good and supportive. When people go towards supplements, you end up with a lot of fillers and things like that. Um, so I don't know if you have an, an answer or maybe just a direction. <laughs> So, so my take on it is, um, I agree with that uh, completely. Um, you should be able to get most of the antioxidants uh, you need from a, from a balanced and healthy diet. I think there are good reasons to have some caution uh, with certain food groups if you're on chemotherapy or really any complex drug, uh, because some fairly innocuous seeming foods or drinks, grapefruit juice, cranberry juice, other things, can affect your liver enzymes and increase or decrease uh, the concentrations of, blood, of certain drugs in your in your system. So always read the drug labels. Always follow uh, advice from a registered dietitian or a, a trained trained uh, healthcare professional if they're giving you uh, nutritional advice, uh, and always question it. Um, uh, I think in terms of uh, there shouldn't be a need to uh, to supplement for antioxidants above and beyond uh, dietary. And provided it doesn't affect the drug metabolism, uh, as in it doesn't interact with those liver enzymes, there's, there should be no risk. Um, the, the caveat, because there's always a caveat, is that um, even some vitamins can be toxic in excess. Um, so vitamin C, for example, can be toxic in excess. Uh, so there's, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. Um, I have, I'm going to give this one to you, because this one's really interesting. I wonder what happens to the brain gut connection when more than half of my digestive tract is removed. So do estimates tend to deal with more depression and anxiety because a large portion of the microbiome is gone? And I will say, because before even the removal of that, there are a lot of studies and 
when you look at linking depression and anxiety with IBD population too, but in specific, what happens when we remove half of their digestive tract? Are you familiar with this at all? Yeah, so, so it's a really interesting question and a, and a very good one. Um, I, I, would, I would step back a little bit from, the, from uh, the question and say, what was the impact of your active disease on your, on your overall mental state and quality of life? Because I imagine if uh, assuming the disease was severe enough to, to lead to that to, uh, degree of resection and assuming that that was something you'd live with for a long time, then the, the net benefit of having the operation uh, so certainly at the time I'm sure would have been considered better than, um, than, than the status quo. Um, the, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done in, in understanding the exact interactions between the gut and the brain. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to simplify it and to assume that it's kind of, um, uh, it, it, it's one thing or, or two things that are in perfect balance and it's not, it's millions and millions of little things that, that every, every symptom that you experience, whether it's a gut symptom or a, or a brain symptom uh, or an impact on your nutritional state is the, is the result of millions and millions literally of individual processes happening. Uh, and our ability to unpick that is, is increasing, uh, but it's by no means there yet. Um, I, think, um, I think actually, just from a purely academic perspective, people with um, uh, with a reduced gut length become a really interesting subject for uh, trying to answer this question. Um, I don't think we know fully. Um, I think that uh, we see it in some ways kind of very directly. So bacterial overgrowth in the, in the small bowel. We, we wouldn't normally expect much bacteria to be in the small bowel. But if you have complex anatomy or, or lots of uh, joins or, um, uh, or, or various types of dysbiosis, then you can end up with, with a um, bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel. And for an ostomate, that can mean lots of gas in the bags. Uh, for an non ostomate, it can mean lots of bloating and discomfort, uh, diarrhea, and sometimes nutritional issues. So um, my, I guess the short answer is we don't know. Uh, and the long answer is, um, is, you know, there's lots of work here to be done, and it's, it's a really, really interesting area. Those are all the questions that I have that have come through the chat. If there's anything else, I can send them through, but not. <laughs> uh, I think the way that you uh, describe the big brain and the little brain um, is, is a really great way of looking at it. Um, there are, like you say, as many nerves in the, in the gut as there are in the, in the brain, um, but they're there to do different things. Uh, and I think it's worth thinking of the gut as, um, you know, primar primarily a, a, uh, a nutritional gate, um, but also a, uh, a really, really important kind of two-way highway for our overall health, like you said. Yeah, and I think what's, what's so interesting because even since I, um, gosh, I graduated nursing school in like 2000, 2006, like, this was not a discussion. I mean, just like the the explosion of the of the research and where this has come to be is really quite fascinating. And just uh, more and more and more it comes. And if this is something that interests you guys, I mean, I would I would encourage you to look at some of the studies that they're even doing on mice. And one of the books I read with the um, gut brain connection, they did fecal transplants to mice, and they actually got the mice to be attracted to the cat. So it really is so incredibly fascinating. And I think, you know, what, what Rob pointed to is that like, we're only really just beginning and, and you know, what will be the future and really as we truly begin to understand more and more and more these connections. Uh, the, the one other thing I'll add is that, you know, with, uh, I obviously wear multiple hats and, and one of the privileges of of working with Eleven Health has been that we can apply this kind of uh, thinking directly in practice. So, um, particularly the impact of nutrition, physical activity, going into surgery well prepared in a good nutritional state uh, is something that we've spent a lot of time looking at and thinking about. And the post-operative nutritional recovery and, and nutrition in in the chronic state of, of conditions and how we can uh, support patients to um, to to have an optimal gut health. 
um, and, and support both kind of psychological and, and physical recovery, uh, I think is a great opportunity. And, and um, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to, to put some of these things that I generally have seen in my career as sort of established problems that I have to go in at the extreme end and try and sort out to something that we can actually head off and prevent in the first place. Pass it back to you, Karen. Well, thank you so much. This was an incredible session. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. We'll send out the recording from this session uh, and we invite you to participate in the next one is next Tuesday, 8 a.m. PST, 11 a.m. EST with another incredible topic which is more related to how, to we, how do we deliver a better patient care. And we'll have people like super interesting the discussions and hopefully you can invite more people to join and see you next week. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Lindsay and Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye.